the conditions are getting critical. There is one image there that shows black people getting off. So people with dark skin getting off. No, dark black. Black skin. Really black. Black. Shalom and welcome back, brothers and sisters. I am your host, Yehuda Moshe, and this is a testimony in Jacob. Before we begin, as always, giving all praise and glory to Yahweh and his son, Yahshua, the anointed Savior, for the revealing of righteousness, love, and truth in the last days. We will be continuing with the tribe of Judah scattered in Africa with the emphasis on the Western regions. I ask if you have not seen part one, two, or three, please stop the video, check those parts out first before continuing and do enjoy the video. Shalom. All right, so we'll begin with slide one, the African Israelites of Arsereth. Our primary source will be out of uh, the Apocrypha in the book of 2nd Ezra, the 13th chapter, uh, verses 40 through 45. Brothers and sisters, I do understand some of us may not regard the Apocrypha as canonical or even historic, but just for the purposes of demonstration, we will be using it as a reference, okay? Okay, so concerning the origin of the word Arsur, we really don't know its, its etymologies. There's a lot of different opinions about it, whether it be of a Persian origin or of its uh, edits, uh, edits uh, in the Hebrew, meaning another land. We, we don't know. Okay, all we know is this is how Ptolemy charted it, okay, in the AD 150s, and this was a, a popular uh, map that unfortunately didn't survive the, the Middle Ages, but you did have copies that were um, replicated by uh, Conrad Swainingham and Arnold Bucknick, okay, during the late Middle Ages. So we see that um, Claudius Ptolemy's work did survive, and we have Arsworth on the map associated in Africa Minoris, and we know that's that's North African region, okay? And from Ezra's, those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Osea the king, whom Salmanasar, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt that they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. And they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river. For the Most High then showed signs for them, and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half. And the same region is called Arsereth. Okay, so the operative word in that is they're traveling through a country, okay? after being brought forth the waters okay that's going to be very important as we understand how the judeans ended up coming into uh into north africa okay the revelation of these rock paintings in the tassili mountains of the algerian sahara just 30 years ago astonished the world whole communities of people who were obviously African in origin had created marvelous galleries of ancient art depicting most vividly the life of the Green Sahara as it must once have been. First we see hunting folk and the animals they lived among. The clearest proof that this region of the Sahara long ago teemed with wild game. The earliest paintings may be seven or 8,000 years old. But not all the people who inhabited this huge region were nomadic hunters. 
This horse, complete with saddle and bridle, points to the development of transport systems and traders. And this ox-drawn plough to the planting and growing of crops. Whether for war or sport, elaborate chariots came into use while the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. The evidence of these paintings suggests a continuous community of peoples living right across the Sahara from the Atlantic to the valley of the Nile. Abandoning their increasingly arid pastures, more and more people from the Sahara had to join their forerunners and follow the trails in search of a secure supply of water. whole communities of people who were obviously African in origin had created marvelous galleries of ancient art depicting most vividly the life of the green Sahara as it must once have been. Whether for war or sport, elaborate chariots came into use. This horse, complete with saddle and bridle, points to the development of transport systems and traders. Whether for war or sport, elaborate chariots came into use, while the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. While the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. While the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. Okay, so our next slide is Tacitus on the Jews, and this is a Roman historian who lived AD 56 till about 120 in the first century. And uh, we're going to take something out of his work, Histories, Book 5, uh, Chapter 2, Section 5. And uh, he states, quote, Many assure us that the Jews are descendants from those Ethiopians who were driven by fear and hatred to immigrate from their home country when Cepheus was king, end quote. Now, we don't know who Cepheus was in history. Uh, he may be, you know, fictional. We don't, uh, we don't really know who he was. So the point made here is, why is Tacitus suggesting that Jews are descendants from burnt-faced individuals? Okay, because that's what uh, the word uh, Ethiopian would mean pragmatically if you're in his time, okay? The second thing is, if Tacitus was around during the Jewish wars against the Romans, why then are not the Jews who fought against the Romans still looking as Ethiopians? Okay, that's that should be um, telling. Okay, but hey, when you're on the wrong side of history, I guess you know these things uh, happen. So here we have two uh, Jewish communities uh, to my left. The, this is the community, I believe, from Demona. And then to the right of that, these are the Igbo Jews, okay, in the same stock, okay? The Black Jews of Arabia, part one, okay? The source will come out of Jewish forerunners of Christianity, and it will be by Adolf de Castro in his photos to the right. And just a little bit on, on his background, he's, he considers himself of the Sephardic uh, origins um, out of Portugal and uh, he's Jewish and he considers himself a, a Jewish scholar so um, that's very interesting what he has to say with regards to the man we'll uh, read about uh, whose name is uh, Bar Kokhba um, I've titled subtitled that Bar Kokhba the black man and we'll see why that is in a second but uh, for, for those of you who may not be aware of who he was he was considered a uh, messianic figure in the Roman Jewish wars, uh, uh, namely the Quito's Rebellion. I believe that was around 117 AD, somewhere around there. The rabbinical legend of Bar Kokhba's origin is very curious. According to it, the Jewish leader was the child of a princess in Arabia of Jewish race as well as her husband, though both were black in color. What did you say, nigga? <laughs> Though both were black in color. The child, however, was born white. The Moorish prince suspected his wife of infidelity and debated whether he ought not to put both her and the child to death. 
Hadrian, before becoming emperor, had been governor in Syria and had visited the Jewish prince's house and possibly had been unduly intimate with his wife. You ought to be ashamed to even let something like that come out of your heathenous mouth. <laughs> Still, the Moor hesitated, and that's Barkakwa's father, and he consulted Akiba, who at the time happened to come to his house as to what he ought to believe. My baby sister was as pure as a driven snow. The rabbi, Rabbi Akiba, was struck with the possible political advantages to be realized for his own plans from control of a son of the proudest house of Rome. Such a one, trained in the wildlife of the desert, might become a suitable leader in mature life for his adopted countrymen against the Roman legions. His crafty mind soon suggested how this might be done, even while the distracted Moor was urgently asking what he thought. Okay. So we're hearing more, more, okay? Barkakba's parents are constantly being referred to as Moors. We know that as black, okay? It was commonly said of him that he could find a reason for anything, meaning Rabbi Akiba. And on this occasion, he found a plausible one for the appearance of a white infant in a dark-skinned household, okay? So the important thing to understand is that Barkakba's mother, at least, was a black Arabian Jewish princess, okay? And the father, though it was uncertain if he was actually the father because Hadrian, before he became emperor, allegedly slept with his mother and the child came out white. We see that there that both the mother and the father uh, were referred to here as Moors. OK, and that these Moors were called Jews. They were they were of the Jewish race. OK, so here is yet another example of a black man leading the Jews against the Romans in, uh, in the Roman Jewish wars. I think the first one should be most familiar to us all is uh, Niger of Piera. He's also known as Niger the Edomite. And we all know what, what a Niger is. These surnames and these uh, appellations uh, really need to be considered, okay? Very important. Queen Dahaya or Kahina and the Dagada Jews, part one. Sources coming out of Report of the Annual Meeting, volume 57 by the British Association for the Advancement of Science, published in 1888. So here's the Judea capture coin, and I, I just have it up so we can have a visual. We see here a black woman, we can see the full lips, we can see the prominent features, the high cheekbones, and the nose. Okay, so we are definitely in Judea. And on the reverse side of that coin, I believe that's uh, Emperor Hadrian and the trophy, and etc. okay? So getting into the account, uh, we see the following. Ancient writers referred to by Josephus and an intimate authority, Tacitus, contend that Libya was the cradle of the Hebrew race. We just read that Tacitus in the previous slides um, stated that he was assured that the Jews are descendants of Ethiopians um, that left their land during the time of Cepheus, okay, whomever that figure was. An old author quoted by Josephus describes a race that were in Western Ethiopia, West Africa, before the time of Abraham, the Judadians. These were probably the Hebrews of Libya and the Sahara. They are different from what are known as Barbary Jews, the descendants of the fugitives of Spain and Portugal. They are rarely seen living in the rifts and Susis as their tradesmen and businessmen and securing protection by a small annual payment. But there are independent tribes who own no master, some on the southern atlas, some far east near the desert of Toreg, some called the Gata in the Sahara and as far south as the Niger. These tribes were described, one of which is protected by the tomb of our beloved lady, that of the Joan of Arc of the Berbers, a Jewish woman, Kahina, who headed them against the Arabs and became their queen, okay? The Arabs were compelled to make peace with her followers, and so great was her reputed sanctity that the district around is a safe asylum for Jews. Some of the Jews in Sahara are black with woolly hair. I'll say that again. Some of the Jews in the Sahara are black with woolly hair, but most of the Berber Jews are very good looking. That means white and their women have the repute of being the most beautiful in the world. The Berber Jews look down on the coast Jews as schematics or illegitimate. 
and are very rigid in their discipline, differing from the others in their dress and rites. All right, that was part two, Queen Dahaya and the Dagada Jews, part three. Sources kind of come out of how a race of pygmies was found in North Africa and Spain by Robert Halliburton. And I know pygmies, that it's a terrible moniker, but it's not actually talking about the pygmies uh, that we find in Africa. This is just the title of the book, okay? So in the book, we see the following. The Dagada, or black Jews, okay? They are black. Remember, this is the same group that was led by Queen uh, Kahina, or Dahaya, okay? The Dagada or black Jews are not in reality Jews, go figure, but are so classed by the Arab traders and slave dealers, just as the other black tribes are Christians. I have come across many of these Dagada who are easily recognizable by the three deep scars on their cheeks, a tribal mark. They are said by the other Sudan tribes to be cannibals and are generally despised on this account and on account of the general belief in their being Jews. So, though the author's opinion doesn't believe them to be Jews, they have in their tradition that they are Jews, meaning the Dagada, okay? As far as I can discover in conversation with such of them as I have met in slavery and who had learned Arabic, they are pagans, but adopt Mohammedism very readily, okay? So these Dagadas, were not only calling themselves Jews, they were also victims of slavery, okay? And we will show more in the future slides. Queen Kahina and the Dagada Jews, part four, uh, same source, okay? Now, this gentleman to the left of the screen, his name is Rabbi Mordecai Sior. He's credited as being the last rabbi of Timbuktu. Now, we're gonna read a little bit about his time in Timbuktu, and the source from that will be coming from uh, Wikipedia. An account of the Dagatun, or that's the Dagata, whose name may perhaps be derived from the Arabic Tugatun, meaning infidels, was first given by Rabbi Mordecai Abi Sirur of Akka, Morocco, who in 1857 journeyed through the Sahara to Timbuktu, and whose account of his travels was published in the bulletin De la Société de Géographie, translated from Hebrew to French. According to Rabbi Mordecai, the Dagatun or the Dagata live in tents and resemble the Berber Torics, among whom they live in language, religion, and general customs. They are fairer or wider in complexion than the generality of the African Jews and are still conscious of their origin. Now, wait a minute, we have a conflict because above we read that the Dagada Jews were, according to uh, Robert Burton, uh, he described them as being black. Are they white or are they black? They are subject to the Toregs who do not intermarry with them. Now, if they resemble the Toregs in their language, in their religion, in general customs, why shouldn't they, they intermarry, brothers and sisters? So this is how we sift through what's truth and what's actually false. Okay, we, we know that these Dagata are black because it, it, it clearly says it, okay? Rabbi Mordecai is the authority for the statement that their settlement in the Sahara dates from the end of the 7th century, again during the time of Kahina, when Abd al-Malik ascended to the throne and pushed his conquest as far as Morocco. At Tamintit, he tried to convert the inhabitants to Islam, and as the Jews offered great resistance, he exiled them to the desert of Ajaj, as he did also the Torics, who had only partially accepted Islam. Cut off from any connection with their brethren, these Jews in the Sahara gradually lost their Jewish practices and became nominally, or by name, Muslims. Okay. Queen Dahaya and the Dagada Jews, Part 5. Henry Marias Exposed. Uh, this is a picture of his father to my extreme right, uh, whose name is Rabbi Sabato Marias. I couldn't find a picture of Henry, but this is his father. Okay, and uh, you can read up on him, but uh, we're going to take the source from Good Literature, Volume 3. Mr. Henry Marias of Philadelphia is the author of Eminent Israelites of the 19th Century, a useful addition to biographical literature because of its mention of names and facts not easily uh, accessible elsewhere. Mr. Marias contributed to the Jewish Messenger for March 11, 1881, an unassuming but scholarly and discriminating 
paper on the Dagatuans, a tribe of Jewish origin in the desert of Sahara. This article has been neatly reprinted in a pamphlet form, price 15 cents by Edward Stern of Philadelphia. So my point in demonstrating that was to show that according to Charles Richardson, Henry Marias's work has been called scholarly also discriminating. And we might be, we might think to ourselves, well, how can it be both? And the answer is in academic circles, you know, people, you know, they, they plagiarize all the time they they fabricate stories or collusion, even, you know, uh, changing up, you know, history and facts. So although we don't know exactly what remarks or uh, portions of his, of Rabbi uh, Marias's work would be classified as discriminating, but we will go ahead and uh, get through the work and we can kind of see and compare what we actually are able to verify as, as fact and uh, what he claims to have been the sayings of uh, Rabbi Mordecai Sior, the, uh, the rabbi to the left, okay? Okay, so we're now in the work of Henry Marias and it's entitled The Dagatans, A Tribe of Jewish Origin in the Sahara. The Torahs regard the Dagatans as an inferior race because of their affinity with the Jews. Hence, they do not permit intermarriages. But a most striking circumstance concerning those who confess themselves of Hebrew stock is their complexion and features. Strange as it may appear in such a clime or climate, Rabbi Sior asserts that, quote, these converted Jews have skin perfectly white. They are very handsome, much handsomer than the finest looking Jews of Africa. Not one is black, end quote. How this may be accounted for, the sequel will tell. Okay, so in my opinion, you know, I can, I can perhaps see how this might be uh, considered somewhat discriminating, you know, against other, uh, other Jews and other uh, people of color. Not one found among the Dagata were black. You know, that I could see how that could possibly be discriminating when we know historically um, there are black Jews. Okay, certainly. And uh, I would love to see uh, what Rabbi Sior had to actually say concerning the skin color. I have not been able to find the primary. Um, there is a supposed uh, translation from French, for, excuse me, from the Hebrew in French um, of Sior's work, but I haven't been able to get my hands on it. If you can find it, do drop a link in the comment section. That would be greatly appreciated. So this is the testament of Abu Bakr, who is a Islamic commander. The source we're going to read out of is Atlas Geographicus by Herman Moll. And he's quoting from an earlier source entitled Primera Parte by Luis Marmol Carvajal. So to establish a little bit of context, we're going to start at the top of the paragraph. It states, so much for the whites. We shall treat of the blacks when we come to Guinea, Negro land and the Cape of Good Hope where they have it. Okay. So everything we're going to read thus forth is pertaining to the blacks. Okay. The Africans on the coast are still very gross idolaters. Marmel says that those of Barbary continued to worship the sun and fire to the year 349 when they were converted to Christianity. Some of the Negroes of lower Ethiopia worship the sun, moon, or stars. Others, water, fire, or the first living thing they met when they went abroad. Those of upper Ethiopia worship the Lord of heaven before the queen of Sheba went to Solomon to be instructed in the law of Moses and the prophets when they embraced Judaism, as did also some inhabitants of lower Ethiopia who continued in it till they were taught Christianity by the queen of Candace's eunuch who was baptized by Philip. In 1067, Mohammedism came into the inland parts of lower Ethiopia with Abu Bakr's son who invaded them. But those on the coast continued in their idolatry, except a few who have been converted by the Portuguese since they sailed to those parts. So this is the testament of Abu Bakr. We'll have more on him in a few. Okay, so the Bagara or Bakara Jews of Sudan, according to Ibn Abizar, and he lived in the 14th century CE. Okay, the subtitle, The Holy War of Tarasna al Lemtuni, and he lived in 1038. He was pretty much a uh, leader in the Western Sahel. So. Okay, so our source is going to begin with Pekka Masonin's The Negro Land Revisited, and it reads, The second argument came from the 14th century Moroccan historian Ibn Abizar, 
who wrote that the Lamtuna chief Tarasna al Lamtuni, who preceded the emergence of the Almoravid movement, had died in a holy war against black Jews in southern Mauritania. A similar claim appears in the Mauritanian oral tradition, according to which the Almoravid Emir Abu Bakr bin Umar died in a fight against black Jews or alternatively Christians, whom he expelled from Adrar. So as we can clearly see from the previous slide that uh, Abu Bakr bin Umar, the son of Umar, comes into uh, lower Ethiopia, okay, or West Africa, okay, and he's bringing Islam with him, okay. Now here's an image of him by, uh, charted by Mesia, uh, Mesia de la Vestes, who is uh, considered Judeo-conversals or a, a Portuguese Jew that has been uh, converted to Christianity. If this is his supposed image, then it is certainly plausible that the Mauritanian oral tradition about Abu Bakr's fight with the black, the black Israelites is not completely out of the realm of reasoning him being black himself, okay? All right, so our next source is going to come from Corpus of Early Arabic Sources for West African History by Nehemiah Lef Lefzion and John Hopkins. Okay, I have my copy right here. As you can see the cover, I'm, I'm going to be reading off screen. So if you don't see the words, that's because I'm reading it from my version and then I'll switch to uh, what you guys can view on the screen, okay? And beginning on the bottom of page 236, it reads, He was succeeded by his son Tamim bin al-Athar, and he remained king of the tribes of the Sanhaja until the year 306, uh, or that's 918 in our time, when the leaders of the tribes of Sanhaja rose against him and killed him. Their cohesion was broken, and after him, they could not agree on anyone. They spoke with different voices and followed diverse fancies for a period of 120 years until there rose among them the Emir Abu Abd Allah Muhammad bin Tafat, also known as Tarasna al Lamtuni. They agreed upon him and made him their leader. He was a man of religion, virtue, and uprightness, and had performed the pilgrimage and engaged in holy war. He remained as Emir over the Sanhaja for a period of three years, then met a martyr's death on a raid he made upon the place called Bakara, or Bagara, okay? The Bakara are tribes of the Sudan and live near the town of Tataklasin to the west of it. They professed Judaism. The town of Tataklasin is inhabited by the Sanhaja tribe called Ben Warith. They are upright people who are Orthodox Muslims. They accept Islam at the hands of Uqba bin Nafi al-Firi at the time of the conquest of the Maghrib. They wage holy war on the Sudan who do not profess Islam. Okay, so here's some uh, here's some pictures uh, rather of the Bukhara. Okay, if you Google Google these people, you'll see that they're as black as you and I. Okay, in former times before they were. Uh, converted to Islam, they were called Jews, okay? Very important. Black Jews, according to al-Zuri and al-Idrisi, okay? And these are two prominent authorities in the Islamic world, uh, circa uh, 12th century CE, common era. Okay, uh, Zuri in particular, he's, he's attributed to over 3,500 narrations in the Sunni Hadith. And these are basically the... Um, the deeds and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, okay? And his, his works uh, can be found in uh, the Qutub al-Sita, or the six books. All right, so we are all familiar with this map of West Africa. We see Lam Lam, and according to Idrisi, the land hereabout was peopled by Jews, okay? Okay, so let's, let's go a little bit more in depth with where that statement uh, derives from. We're going to use the, uh, the source from... Pekka Masonin in the Negro Land Revisited, it reads as follows. West African Jews are also found in the 12th century works of Al-Zuri and Al-Idrisi. The former, who is Al-Zuri, describes a Sudanese people called the Amima who profess Judaism and read Torah. Whereas the latter, or Al-Idrisi, mentions that the inhabitants of Lam Lam in an area south of Ghana were Jews but infidelity and ignorance overcame them. It is impossible to know 
what these two authors meant by these remarks. Did they honestly believe that black Jews lived in West Africa? Or are their claims based upon some sort of confusion and popular legends of the 10 lost tribes of Israel? Okay, now anything being attributed to a legend, we know in academic circles, that's that's false. Okay, so we, we're not saying that's the author's opinion. He's just, you know, posing the question, okay? Okay, so the black Jews of Janawa, and this is a mere corruption of uh, Janawa, is a mere corruption of the word Guinea. The source will be coming from Corpus of Early Arabic Sources for West African History again, uh, Nehemiah Lep Zion, okay? The third section, Janawa. Its boundaries on the west is the Great Sea, or the Atlantic Ocean, and on the east, the end of the land of War Warakhan, as far as the end of the land of the Amoravids. On the south, it is bounded by the land of Amima. Okay, remember the Amima Jews from the previous slide. And the Bujara and Lami, and on the north, by the end of the land of Azuki, and the end of the land of No, belonging to the land of the farthest Sus. In it, there is the town of Ghana. Between this town and the Great Sea to the west, which is the Atlantic, there is eight days traveling. It is the capital of Janawa, Guinea. Caravans from the land of the farthest Sus and the Maghrib go there. In former times, the people of this country professed paganism until the year 1076 when Yahya ben Abubakar Emer of Musafa made his appearance. They turned Muslims in the days of the Lamtuna and became good Muslims. Today, they are Muslims and have scholars, lawyers, and Quran readers, and have become preeminent in these fields. Some of their chief leaders have come to Al-Andalus. They have traveled to Mecca and made the pilgrimage and visited the Prophet's tomb and returned to their land to spend large sums on the Holy War. From this country, Janawa, Guinea, desert slaves are imported. The people of Ghana make raids on the land of Barbara and Amina and capture their people as they used to when they were pagans. Amima are a tribe of Janawa who live on the coast of the Great Sea in the west. They follow the religion of the Majus. On account of their paganism, no one enters their country and no merchandise is imported into it. They wear sheepskins. They have plenty of honey and live in the sand without any building except tents, which they make from desert grasses. The people of Ghana make raids on them every year. Sometimes they conquer them and sometimes they are conquered. These people have no iron and fight only with clubs of ebony. For this reason, the people of Ghana overcome them, for they fight them with swords and spears. Any slave of them can run on his own legs faster than a thoroughbred horse. Okay. And we know these Amima, okay, these Amima Jews, they must be black because of the statement said here. These, these slaves are faster than thoroughbred horses. I think we all know who that's referring to right there, okay? So on this account, Al-Zuri does not expressly call them black, but we know that they're black just based on the region that they're living in. Okay, so I want to thank and bless you all for tuning in to the series. It's been a pleasure a journey and an experience. We will be returning in future videos with various topics. Um, if you would like to provide any feedback on what those topics uh, should be, uh, we would really appreciate that with a comment down below. And let us call to mind the words of the great preacher, indeed Solomon. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Shalom. Either I know or I don't know. No. How can you disagree with the truth? truth, truth. How do you screen the essence of your Rupa? Real God resonated on the word of Yehuda. Black Israel light scrapped up with the Ubop. Catch your body on 27 to get a Uber. Mama Duke up in the church with a hallelujah. Proceeds never reached the Aborigines. All the young nigga broke, tucking on the lemon squeeze. Hoping police don't kill him before he could get at ease.